Originally trained as an architect, Kemi Adesoye's interest in screenwriting began after discovering a screenwriting book in a university library. She further enrolled for screenwriting and directing courses in New York Film Academy, Los Angeles, Hollywood, and participated in several writing workshops in South Africa, Togo, Zanzibar, Nigeria, and Germany. Over a 10 year career, Kemi scripted short films Mama Poot, Prize Maze, National Kick, The Liner, A New You. New Horizons and Turning 50. She also developed and wrote TV series Doctor's Quarters, Teen Cell Season 1 to 6, Hotel Majestic, Edge of Paradise, and was head writer for Sugar Niger Season 1, Season 4, and Season 5. Crazy, Lovely Cool Season 1, Battleground Season 1. In 2021, she developed and scripted Imposter, Steel in Production, Kami penned thriller and comedy features The Figurine, Phone Swap, on Mugo, currently streaming on Netflix, and in 2021 wrote Netflix original A Niger Christmas and Glamour Girls. In 2021, Kemi Adesoye was awarded and recognized in category of Outstanding Creative Scriptwriter at Nigeria as 60 Jubilee Special Awards. Kemi Adesoye currently resides in Lagos, Nigeria, West Africa. To be honest, my first exposure to film was what you saw, the actors looking gorgeous and acting. I said, yes, that's it. I want to be an actress. I don't know how. I was just saying it because, to be honest, all the path I was walking on was in architecture. And we came from a family where you dare not say, <laughs> you're studying arts. <laughs> what? It has to be science or something. But... I'm just so grateful that now in this generation, there's so much opportunity out there. Anything you want to learn is out there on YouTube. As um, our guy has said, I even said he has finished work. He has said everything. Even when he says start, you just start. People say, oh, Auntie Kemi, I want to write. And eh, write now. Who is stopping you? Teach me. Go. I say if you have downloaded everything on YouTube first, there are scripts on YouTube. There are movies that are giving you basically the answer to a story. That is how the story progression is. If you have observed all that and you haven't, and when I say even write, even a short story, five pages, doesn't have to be. A feature film is like 100, 150 pages. Nowadays, they're even going two hours. I'm like, my God, what's going on? But even four minutes, five minutes, a story, you can write it and communicate and people will respond, and you can touch people emotionally. Do you know that even in America, they give um, Oscar awards to five-minute films? Five-minute films. So they, they look at story and content as something that they don't joke with. So don't uh, despise the day of small beginnings. I'll say just go ahead and write. When I was asked to come here, I was like, I asked Pastor Shala, I said, what am I going to talk about? Am I going to talk about writing? This is how you write a story and everything. And I had a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if they have it. Okay, yeah. Just at least the, the art of storytelling. As you can see, you have a picture of uh, people gather around the fire. Because the first type of storytelling we had and we were exposed to, especially in our culture, was the one you see by, with your mouth. Storytelling around the fire, tales by moonlight. I don't know if anybody remember those things. <laughs> you know, one time even at home, they, they took light, Nepa. And we didn't have light for four days. My, my mother gathered all us kids and started telling us stories. And for four days, we didn't have the television, just stories. And I remember I, there was just something wonderful about it. The communal experience gathering around. By the time they brought back light, it felt like we lost something because we're now, now back to the TV. <laughs> we all went back to the TV, but there's just something about storytelling, especially the oral tradition. Now, um, there's a place in the Bible that said that I'll stand upon my watchtower and see what he will say. Why am I seeing what he's saying? There's something insane saying produces pictures in your head. If I say London, some of you have never been to London, but you already, you've already seen um, big red bus, um, Buckingham Palace, all those images, yet you've never been because somebody said and you saw it. 
So that, in a way, that's what films, filmmaking and your story is. It should be so visually stimulating that they are saying, but he is also saying. Though nowadays, because everything is, uh, I mean, we have video, we have movies, everything is now visual. It's not always oral now. So I just wanted to just high point that. Can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Everyone has a story. Everyone, even your great, 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 great. If there are stories that have been pa passed down from generation to generation, that's a story. You have to treasure the stories we have. Because if we're not careful, foreigners will come, take your story, repackage it, and sell it back to you. They will do it because they're running out of stories. This Brazilian project is tied to the mythology of African culture, which is basically our stories that was imported by the Brazilian, by the slaves that was taken over there. They're, they're, find, they're finding value in it. They're finding value in it. So don't take your stories for granted. Even that story about um, when um, you're, there's one culture and this and that and that, there's weight in those stories. And everybody has a story. Now, it can be a modern story. It could be um, an old story. There's a saying that when an old person dies, a library dies with them. Things we thought we should have known, we have forgotten. Like the, an old man that was my neighbor that told me that, ah, that in our tradition, um, it's not seven days a week, it's four days a week. Can you imagine? To us, because we've been so, you know, the coloni colonized Seven days is seven days. We didn't know that our own tradition was four days. I think it was four days or five days. You know, so all these are valuable things. Imagine having a story in which somebody's clock is based on that four-day structure. And somebody is on the Western, is on the seven-day structure. And yet people don't understand until they realize the clue. He's working on this time, not that time. You see, so those are precious seeds you have. I mean, go back. I, I know that some people are like, ah, no, we've left the past behind. But sometimes you have to look to the past to know where you're going. So that's why I say everybody has a story. But then also do not discount your, the story that you're, that you're currently in in your life or people around you. It may not look like it now. Sometimes you even need perspective in a story because when you have an experience... You have to walk th right through it before you see, okay, there's a story in that. There's a lesson in that. Basically, our life is a story. We're either in the beginning, we're either in the middle, <laughs> or hopefully we're not rounding up. <laughs> the good thing about story is the middle part is the longest part <laughs> before the end. Okay. Can we change the slide again, please? I don't know... Um, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Where does your story take place? Sorry, this, this one is very, um, how do you say it? This is when I become an academic and I'm saying, okay, how do you find your story? Where, do, where does your story take place? Write what you know. Is it what happens at home? Is it uh, in my village? Is it in Lagos? Is it in another part of the world? If you've never been to America, can you write more American than an American? Can an American write as a Nigerian? I've read texts where I could see an American writer did research and wrote about Nigeria, like a character that's Nigerian, but I could tell he was still not Nigerian because they are just those little things, those little inflections that are us, that are unique to us, that they cannot replicate. We, to an extent, because we've downloaded so much American culture, we can, we can, some of us can, you know, push it a bit. But still, America is still not just what you see on screen because they have hoods. They have their own culture, the black culture, the white culture, everything. The, even, even the states have their own culture and they have 51 states. So which one are you writing for? Write what you know. That's your power. Write your culture. That's your power. Write being Nigerian. That is your power because that no other person can replicate. Right now, I don't know who watches K-drama. Does anyone? Okay. Don't be ashamed. 
it's okay, K drama. If you K drama are Korean soaps or Korean um, films, and they have selling their culture, they sell their food, they sell their room. Even somebody said that's not real Korea. That's not how they really are, but they are selling it. This image of perfection. This image of, oh, we're very liberal. Apparently, they are not. Oh, we're the greatest uh, romantic people. Apparently, they are not. They're actually very misogynistic people. But they are selling this image. What image is Nigeria selling? What image are we selling? Now, I'm not saying you have to uh, say, okay, I have to be very social conscious in my storytelling. No, you don't have to. Just... Be creative. I think this whole, I mean, I have, wasn't here from the beginning, but I think you already know. Be creative. What comes into your mind? It's a gift. That's the thing with creativity. It's a gift. It is there. It's for you to dig it up, refine it, and put it out there. And refining is a process. That's one thing that also we should learn. Because when I left university, I still had to go through process of learning how to write. Yes, I had the gift, but it had to be refined. And some people take it for granted that, oh, I don't want a regular job. I want to be creative because it looks like fun. A lot of Lagos people that are in the creative, in creative world, okay, not a lot of them, but there are some pretenders. They grow dreadlocks. No offense to anybody who has dreadlocks. They uh, strut around. They say all the right words, you know, because they think we're creative. We're creative. We wear jeans and, you know, we smoke. And, yeah, that's what, that, is that what being creative is? Not necessarily. <laughs> no. So, can we, can we go to the next one? Hero versus villain. Okay, this is also academic. Maybe this is for tomorrow's session. But, basically, this is just filtering down what a story is. A basic story, you have a hero. He has a problem or a conflict. He has a villain, and he has to overcome that villain to succeed. You can say, eh, but it's already sounding like superhero. Eh, eh. If a story could be all about how somebody wanted to go to the market, that's his desire. Then it started raining. That's his problem. What does he do to get through the rainstorm and still go to the market, especially if what he needs to buy can save somebody's life? You see, that's a very simple story. That can even be a short story. It could even be a comedy. It could be a horror. It could be any genre you want it to be. But you have a person who has a problem that he has to overcome. And then we wonder, would he overcome it or will he fail? Will the person that he's trying to buy whatever he needs to live or die? That's just basically every story has that. So... In coming up with a story, you have to have a hero, a character. He, you also have to have what he's coming up against. Can we have the next line, please? The hero. This is basically a I know this is Denzel. Uh, I think that's Denzel Washington, but I just put his face there because he usually plays the hero part. It's always about a character. And the next, please. Next slide. Thank you. These are just images just to stimulate you, so I'm not just talking. The villain. The villain can be a man, could be a woman, can be a thing. Can we go to the next? Uh -huh. The villain, because of the villain in the presence of the character, you have conflict. Now, conflict is what your character goes against in the story. If a story doesn't have conflict, like that story about the man who wants to go out and buy something in the market. It is the rain. The rain is his enemy. The rain is his villain. The rain is that thing that will stop him from getting what he wants. These are visual images to give you ideas of the types of conflicts. Now, on this side, you know, the, the normal type of conflict everybody knows, war, fighting. That's a form of conflict. <laughs> yeah. Man versus man. Man wants something, another man is trying to stop him from getting what he wants. Can anyone guess what the second one is? The one with the tree and the lightning? 
weather, nature. You see, it, Americans are very good at this. It's either a tornado is going to come to our town and scatter us, except if 36, in 36 hours we can save ourselves. So the conflict is against nature. Or an asteroid, uh, what, a planet is coming and it's going to destroy Earth and we're all going to be done. They have built genres on that. I don't know whether in Nigeria we've even never done something like that. That, ha, it's flooding in Lagos. How are we going to survive? <laughs> you see, that's even this. You, and that's a story Lagosian people, oh, sorry, Abuja people don't, you know, Lagos. You know, communities will start rowing boats, you know, yacht. I say yacht, I mean, people will be rowing. <laughs> you see, that's a story. The third one, can anyone tell me? Man versus. The third one. Yes, man versus the system. This is a perfect example. In Nigeria, in Lagos, we call them Lasma or Loma. Loma stops your car. You're already in conflict by when you stop. You know you're in conflict with the system. The system is these people can stop you anytime, whether you did wrong or don't, or they suspect you did wrong or didn't. Last one. Now, I know that they're a force for good, but some people have abused it. So there's a system among them that, you know, turns, tends to abuse. What do you do? Man versus system. Even in the Bible, was it Daniel had a was against the system. They say you should bow. Daniel said, I ain't bowing. I ain't bowing. Do what you can. I ain't bowing. Ah, most of us will bow, and, that's be, and there'll be no story. But the story is when the conflict comes against you, and instead of you sitting down and saying, okay, I'll bow. Well, you know, I'm using it just to bow. I mean, you can be abusing them, you know. They say your boss can do it a lot. Oh, ah, we're bowing, we're bowing. But Daniel said no. He stood against the system and he knew the repercussions. If he didn't stand against the system, there will be no story. It's just like saying if you didn't stand against the conflict, there will be no testimony. There will be no. So in your individual lives, you're running your own story in your life right now. When you say, I don't know how to write a story, think about your life. I want to pass the exam. What is coming against me? Is it corrupt lecturer? Is it the fact that I have problem reading? Look at your life and you will understand that your life is a story. So that one is uh, the end was, was taken from the NSAS movement. So you can, you can tell. What about this one? Man and Beast. I think the movie came out earlier this year. Right? Or is it still in cinemas? The beast. The beast. That is a man. Can you imagine just the story about a man and a beast or a monster? Now, this one's a lion. They have done the ones in which is one Godzilla or one gigantic creature from Mars will come and man will be conflict. That's what the conflict is about. That's another type of story. But as you said, these ones have evolved mostly from America because... They just had to come up with things. I think they got bored. So they had to just keep coming up with all these things, which, to commend them, they're very quite exciting. And then the next one. What's that one about? Relationship, marriage. It's emotional. That one did not need storm, hellfire, or a planet coming to destroy us. It didn't need a political system. And it wasn't, well, actually, it's actually caused by man because, you know, emotional marriage, that's almost, but it's a different type of conflict. It's emotional. Those ones are easier to write because everybody can relate to it. Breakfast. Everybody can, re can relate to that. That's why love stories sell. That's why, ah, because when I was in teen cell, actors will come and say, ah, you know, why don't you give my character a, a romantic, you know, love story? And we're looking at them like, is that, can't you be more creative than that? Because they know it's cheap and easy. 
find boyfriend for somebody and then let them have problem. Hey, people will watch me more. People, people like relationships. People like to know what relationships are going on, what's going on. People want to feel the heartbreak because it's like, that's how it happened to me. That is how he cheated me. Hey! And all those things. <laughs> then the last one. I'm sure no. Kai! You guys are too smart. Man versus himself. It's not a monster, it's not a system. It is you. It could be your anger issue. It could be your addiction issue. It could be your attitude issue. You've got to fix it because that attitude is stopping you from progressing. It's stopping you from achieving. It's stopping you from getting that job because they say you have too much bad attitude. So you have a character. And the usual thing is the character thinks they're okay. They think they're fine. Because when it's yourself, it's harder to see that you are your own enemy. You see, so these are the types of conflicts. Can we switch to the... Uh -huh. So basically, you got it right. Conflict between man and man. Conflict between man and society. Conflict between man and nature. Conflict between man and himself. So that's it. Can we move on, please? So those are the types of conflict. Before I go to story structure, let me talk a bit more about being a writer. Why? Why do you want to be a writer? If somebody had actually sat me down and told me the journey it would take, I would have said, you know, maybe I should have gone for that banking job or banking interview. Because being a writer is not like being in a bank where after maybe two years, you're open for review. You know, there's a new position. There's that position you've already mapped out. Okay, by two years, I should be in this position. And by two, yeah, another one year, I should be in this position. It ebbs and it flows. There are peaks and there are valleys. And the valleys will question, make you ask yourself, that do you really, are you sure? It will make you question, question yourself. And that's the reality of it. Passion will make you start off on this journey. But stamina is what will keep you in it. And that's the truth. I have writers today that their, their landlord asks them, what do you do? Are you 419? You stay at home from morning to night. We don't, you know, you call, you bring home money, but we're not sure. You say, yeah, writer. They say, write what? <laughs> what are you writing? We too, we read English. So does that make me a writer? What differentiates you between anyone who writes and being a creative writer is the craft. So the training. I've trained with writers that the first idea that comes out of their heads, they think is gold. Nobody can touch it. Nobody can criticize it. And sometimes it's good. But sometimes you have to be able to listen to critique. And creatives can be very, and uh, even me, I will complain. I don't, how can't they? You criticize. You don't understand, but I'm listening. And I'm going, okay. Am I writing it wrong? What am I missing here? You should be open. You should be teachable. And that's part of process. Go to school. Learn screenwriting. If you can't, go online. What helped me was I grew up at home watching all these American TV movies and British BBC. I didn't know I was getting an education because I started seeing patterns, beginning, middle, end. I could recognize the patterns because they are there. It's like Ojoro, every time you watch a film, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. Are we in the beginning part? No, it's like we're in the middle. Okay, we're wrapping up to the end. It's done so smoothly that sometimes you don't notice. But if you watch enough movies, you notice the pattern. There's a pattern. Some say it's a formula, but it's still a pattern. It's called story structure. Beginning is always when we see the character, we see the world. Is it taking place in Abuja, Lagos, London? We are introduced to the characters. 
And by the end of the beginning, we're introduced to the conflict. The conflict is to tell us, what's this film about? Okay, it's man versus nature. Okay, it's man versus himself. Okay. And then the middle. After this, we have recognized the enemy, the villain, the man versus who. What happens? The confrontation, which is the middle act. The middle act is the longest part of the movie and usually where writers get lost because that is when the craft of screenwriting, that is when you can get tired and like, I beg, I'm not writing this thing. It's not making sense. And for writers that are not too, that are not yet strong, they start introducing new characters. You start adding things that were not there in the beginning. It's like, okay, you said the story happened, you know, only in an office. Then the next thing, they are on the moon. How did they get there? No, I it felt boring, so I needed to put, inject new... Mm -mm, you've lost the plot. That's when they say you lost the plot. It's like you're not adding things that don't really make sense. And then, God willing, you successfully finish the middle and then you wrap up on the end. In every movie, either good or bad, there's a lesson to be learned. If a movie is a bad... Sorry, I'm talking from the one I know, which is screenwriting which means I write for movies. A movie is bad. Learn from it. Why is it bad? What went wrong? Sometimes I read critiques of movies, and I'm like, these are not critiques. They're just saying, and um, he should have worn a blue shirt instead of a red shirt, and the way he laughed. Uh, okay, you can critique the actor, critique the story. What went wrong? Was it middle? Was it the beginning? Was it the end? So... That is story structure. Every story has a structure. And that's one of the easiest things that you would learn. There are different types of structures, but you can master the structure, then you can start messing with it. But master it first. From architecture, foundation, then the top, then the roof. Beginning, the middle, and the end. You can't start from the top, from the roof, and then go to the building, and then build the foundation last. You build up. So that's the basic thing about story. Now back to career in writing. Write your story. The wonderful thing about now that I didn't realize when I started, I envy those who own their content, produce their content, and show up in their content like my other here. Please clap for him. Clap for him. If I had known that earlier, <laughs> because the truth is, what's the last film anybody here ever watched? Okay, you watched it. Who wrote it? I know who made the film. Yeah, yeah. You know who acted in it? That. Mm. Yes. He acted in it. Uh, Kunlia Folayo is the producer. He acted in it. Not the, main Not the main character. But honestly, I don't know who wrote it. And that is the life of a screenwriter. Even if you said you watch Endgame. Watch Endgame. Endgame. Fantastic movie. Who wrote it? No clue. <laughs> Who wrote it? So we're the unsung heroes. The only time they remember us is when they don't like a film. Who wrote this film? <laughs> Who wrote this rubbish? It's like when you see a house that falls down. Who built it? Who designed? Who's the architect? They forget they're engineers. <laughs> Where are the engineers? Where are the plumbers? Where are the struggle engineers? What they say is the architect's fault. It's the architect. Meanwhile, the architect has finished work, drawn his plan, handed it to the, to the engineers who decided that, in fact, we need less, less structure. We need to reduce this. And then they start, they start doing the thing. And then the thing turns out the way it is. And then ah, everybody blames the architect. So that was one thing that I didn't really occur to me, that the only people that know you are the producers. They are the producers. And that is such a collaborate 
work that when you finish writing your script and give it to the company or whoever ordered it. Bye bye. <laughs> In fact, some don't even want to see you again. In fact, some don't even invite you on set. In fact, sometimes it's good they don't invite you on set because if you see what you see, you will scream. Yes, it happened to me. I started vibrating. Why are they shooting it like that? They can change it. And then sometimes it's a creative change that you were not made aware of, but it works. So sometimes directors don't want writers there. I've been on a set where they told me, don't talk to the actors. The actors came from a drama background. Now, drama background, usually the director is also the writer. So they wanted to ask me questions. And the film director said, no, you're confusing. If they talk to you, you probably tell them something slightly different to how I want them to act. It's just that he has to, the director has to di direct them in the way he feels appropriate. It could still work with the script, but maybe not the way I would say it. But then it's also a question, who owns the power, the director or the writer? When a movie is about to be made, that's when they remember the screenwriter. Because you need an idea. You need a foundation. And that's when they look for screenwriters. And they go to film festivals abroad. They don't, abroad people do not know Genevieve. They don't know, maybe some do. They don't know all your local actors that you love. So they are not saying, oh, we'll watch it because of Genevieve. No, they'll watch your story because, they'll watch your film because of the story. What is the African story? I, you know, I want to see from African point of view. What are, because if they watch your stories, they feel they may understand you a bit more. The way we seem to understand Americans, you know, when we understand why they talk like that and, you know, I got to collect my welfare and blah, 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 blah. I, even we know welfare. We don't have welfare in Nigeria, but we know they have welfare. I got to pay my taxes. What taxes? It was just a few years before that we started paying taxes in Nigeria, you know. You know, I got to think of the mortgage. Somebody wrote a script. He's Nigerian. And the guy had a problem. His problem was his mortgage. I was like, wait, 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 wait. I said mortgage care. And I could tell that he had been so influenced by American culture that he felt mortgage. Since over there, they always complain about the mortgage. This person, the mortgage is a good conflict to have, mortgage. I had to, I said, my, I said my sister, mortgage is not working. It's not working. It's not working. We don't have mortgage. <laughs> Hey, hey, find the Nigerian equivalent, be here. Don't try to impress, you know. And what's more, the lady was driving in a car and a police man stopped her. Madam, can you step out of the vehicle, please? Can we have you? I was like, she didn't say with accent, but with the way the dialogue was going, I was hearing American, 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 American. So I had to call her back and say, right for here. Right for here. I know you're trying to feel, okay, I want to be international. I want to, uh, 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 uh. In fact, recently, I had a meeting with people on Netflix. And they say what they want is to produce content that people in the area, I mean, local content. If the local people like it, the global people will appreciate it. So it's not you trying to Right, like an American. Now, I'm not saying that because of the global culture that there's been a mix. Because right now, we even know what's happening in America. Sometimes before the Americans. Even sometimes our friends abroad know what's happening in Nigeria before even we do. So everything's kind of mixed up. But still, don't forget the identity of being in Nigeria. And that that is the one card you have. Even Pidgin English. Ah! When he was speaking, it was so sweet. I was like, damn. You know, it, I, my own is, is, is a bit too clean. And even when I try to write pigeons, sometimes I know that sometimes it's not well cooked. I have to call somebody and like, please, you know, you know, 
tell me how, how, how you say this, you know, how, uh -huh. especially if the character is like that. If that character is somebody who speaks worry, ah, no, I have to bring a worry person in. I say, oh boy, please help me. I don't know how to, uh, you know, and the person will give me, the, I'll be like, this is sweet. Can an American do that? Can any other person do that? No. And the thing is, when you write like that, you are touching the hearts of your people because they see themselves represented and it feels real to them. And once your audience feel it, then they believe the story and they're like, okay, I'm ready. I've, 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 you've done the assignment. Let me watch this story because I believe the character. Because this character looks like me, sounds like me, behaves like me, is in a world that represents me or that I am in, you know, imbibing. Okay, back to screenwriting. So that is why I appreciate people like I have to say appreciate. Because he has his content. We write for people. And people have their own agendas. Has anyone here ever watched Tinsel? Do you realize that they never go to church? They never go to a mosque? We never talk about religion? We never talk about maybe spirituality, maybe a bit, but we never go there. Am I saying it's wrong? No. But this was one of the things they put in place because they felt they don't want to upset anybody. So let's keep religion out of it. Have you noticed how hard it is in American movies to hear in the name of Jesus? You can hear God. But mm -mm. in fact, America, I was so influenced by... <laughs> American TV, what I was a child, that I realized that whenever somebody's upset, especially if it's a young person, they run away. It's like, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> where, where are you going <laughs> in Nigeria? Where are you going? <laughs> so one day I tried it on, who was it? I think it was one of my brothers. I don't know which one. I don't know whether it was Reverend Shala. I don't know whether he, either he was bullying or teasing me. I, like, bleh, bleh, bleh. And then I ran. As I was running, I was like, where am I going, Seth? Where, am I, where are you going? <laughs> I had picked up a mannerism that is totally alien and foreign to my culture. As a child, I had absorbed it. In fact, I developed an accent in primary school. I talked funny. I didn't know because I had watched too much TV. So they were laughing at me. I was like, what's the, what's the problem? What's the problem? <laughs> I'm like, how are you sounding like? And, I, and my primary school was um, Air Force Base. So, you know, like military kids. So, and, they, and I didn't even know. Honestly, up to this day, I don't know why my mom took me there because, man, I, those people were tough. So I was the only outsider. They, you know, they, they hung up to, you know, like bad people, ah, ah, bad kids, you know, ah, ah, what? And then I'm like, hey, uh, where is she from? <laughs> Why is she talking like that? And they would laugh. And I'm wondering, ah, ah, what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> Let me even tell you a story. In fact, after school, I ended up in a radio job. And back then, thank God, the radio now, they talk normal. But it was encouraged to talk like an American and say, good morning, Lagos. You're listening to blah, 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 an FM station. Yes. And Nigerians were chopping it. Ah, ah, then. But now we are like, I beg, proudly Nigerian. <laughs> but there are still some people, you know, that like that. And actually, to be honest, in our culture, there are some people that, when they talk, we won't give respect until some people in their mentality until we start hearing the accent. And then it's like, oh, okay, it's like this person is traveled. The thing is, now you have a lot of people, a lot of accents. We don't know where, where it's coming from or where it's going. We don't. And everybody just... And, only, and the worst thing is, it has seeped into acting. When we act in our native dialect, we're more natural because we're being ourselves. 
whether it's Yoruba, Igbo, or I even hear that um, there's a show that's going to be all Igbo. And I was like, yes, about time. Now, as an actor, you should actually be able to do different ones. But for Nigerian actors, when Tinsel started, I started noticing all this accent, and I wasn't comfortable with it. I was like, why can't they talk like themselves? They were reading English. And so, so when in their mind, they're like, ah, this is English. They now stiffen up and uh, put up airs. And the funny thing with acting is when you're faking it, people can tell. When you're not being real, we can tell. <laughs> okay. And some people have taken out that that is acting. And they're blowing accents. And when I say blowing accent, the accent is not gelling. Even the accent is like, I don't even know where I am. <laughs> Where I'm from. <laughs> and some people who hear the accent and they don't know any better will treat you better because, oh, she's speaking with an accent. <laughs> Luckily, I have a sister that whenever people blow too much accent, she now becomes local. She say, eh, eh. It's like the higher you go, she said, eh, okay. She now becomes, goes down. Just because it's like, I beg, please, too much work. Let's calm down here. Yeah, so back to screenwriting. You want to be a screenwriter. It will test you. It will test you. You have to show you love it before it loves you back. That's why I tell people. Just like you produce content, you have to keep on. You can't say take no for an answer. You have to love it. Like, I love it. I love it. I can't do anything. And just go continue. God sees your heart. He sees your effort. We'll crown it with success. Just keep on going. People ask me, so how do you get the gigs? <sighs> the thing is, it's tougher in Nigeria because we don't have structure. Abroad, you have screenwriting schools. You have writing classes. You, you, they teach TV. It's just now that people are waking up to it because they have seen that, ah, this is a viable opportunity of making money. I have friends who the only reason they got the job was they put a pager on um, Facebook. Like maybe they wrote a script, one page, and just said, oh, I write scripts. And somebody said, oh, yeah, come, okay, come, let's try you. Then, just like, sorry again, I have to refer to you. Some people will write a script and then they are scared that somebody will tiff it. Which is a real fear. Ah, they would, my intellectual property, they would take it from me. Yes, the thing is you actually need wisdom in that field, but the truth is, if nobody reads your work, how are we going to know whether you can write? If you have a one-page script that somebody can tiff, yeah, that means maybe you're a good writer. And if you can do one, that means you can do 10 or 20. Don't be discouraged. Somebody has to see your work or read your work. You have to be able to risk it. To be honest, there are producers that steal people's work. They do. And it's very insultive. Because sometimes they take it, add their own, mess it up. And yeah, like, if he had only come to me and said, right, I would have told him how sweet the story was going and everything. And the thing is, in this industry, there are a lot of sharks like that. And I would not lie, and that's the truth. But I have built a career writing for other people. Other people's measures or standards. I liken it to a fashion designer. If somebody said they wanted a mini skirt this short, would I sew it if I'm the best fashion designer? If they say, oh, yeah, fashion designer, but I wanted this short, and you're thinking, but girl, why are you wearing that? That is not, that is not even biblical <laughs> dressy. Except I tie a scarf with it. Okay, I can make a scarf <laughs> to join. So if somebody comes to you and says you should write a horror film, would you write it? A thriller? Pornographic? He said it, so I didn't say that. <laughs> he said it. <laughs> Money ritual. 
And the amazing thing, all these are conflicts, which shows that where the conflict begin? From the Garden of Eden. We were minding our business until that fruit got eaten. There was no conflict on earth. Adam did not have conflict with God. God did not have, man did not have conflict. Adam did not have conflict with Eve. But once that fruit, the knowledge of good and evil, suddenly screenwriting industry started. Because suddenly there's story. When somebody says, hey, come, there's story, story. Everybody's like, what, 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 what? You think we want to hear good news? We want to hear what happened. What happened? What happened? What happened? Ah, he beat him. Hey, he him. Ah, he punched him. Mm. Conflict. Even all these things. Man versus nature. Is it nature? Was that the nature God intended? Man versus beast. Man versus himself. Yeah. So this whole business is actually built on <laughs> on what? <laughs> on conflict. Does that mean that we can't tell good stories? Of course. It tells good stories of people overcoming. That's why the Bible says that, um, the Bible is the book of heroes. Heroes who overcame. Heroes of the Bible. Abraham, Daniel, all those people. They overcame all manner. All manner of beings. And that's why even the Bible is the greatest, greatest script. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. Can we go to the next slide, please? I, I don't remember what it is, or is it done? Oh, okay. Three-act structure. I think we just run through this one. This is basically the formula structure for a script. Um, maybe if we have time tomorrow, we can revisit. Can I have the next slide, please? Write and show what you only need. It's like when people tell a testimony. You see, I was trusting God for a shoe. And then I woke up, and as I woke up, I stumbled and I fell. Ah, and my toe was, my toe injured me. And then I had to get plaster, but there was no plaster. So I had to go to the chemist. And when I kept the chemist, I saw this auntie for like, and I hadn't seen her in a long time. And she asked, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm okay and everything. But, ah. but then she told me about her son. And then I, I greeted her son, and then I came back. And then when I came back, I was like, oh, okay, this, where are you going with this story? <laughs> You're giving us extra Background things that happen, but is it essential to the story? That's another thing when you're writing a story and you start giving us Jara we did not ask for. Jara that has no bearing on the plot. Unnecessary padding. And usually shows that you have lost track of your story. You've lost the plot. When they say losing the plot, that's virtually what it means. It means you started strong, but you lost your focus. You forgot what your story is about. Or what was it about? And because you got stuck, you got desperate and started adding things. Have you ever watched a movie in which a character that was not there for the first one hour, 30 minutes, suddenly showed up and started performing things? And it seemed like that story was all about this person. And you're like, but, but what happened to the people in the beginning of the story? <laughs> you know, or it started like this is comedy. And then halfway it switches to horror. Uh-uh. You set it up as comedy, and then now it's horror. I'm not saying that you can't switch, but the horror must, elements must have been in the beginning, in the DNA. <laughs> the DNA of your story, it should be already there. So when it fully manifests, we are not shocked because you've been telling us slightly that this thing is not how you see it. Oh, this, 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 this thing is there. So... And then how did I learn to write from pencil to paper? I didn't know how to type. I got my first laptop. This is how I was typing. Pam. Pam. I don't know how all of you started. Maybe people started because they're good with texting now. But I started one finger at a time. And then the fingers became faster. Then this one decided to help the other hand. And then one day I was tapping. 
I, I wasn't using, you know, there's, there's actually a science to typing. There's a, this one is for, mm-mm. Honey, I was just writing. So don't say, ah, oh, I don't even have it right. You're even free. Write it. Keep it. Keep writing. It's never enough. Writing is rewriting. Don't say, because I wrote 200 pages. It is perfect. It is not. Do you know how many drafts of scripts sometimes in Hollywood they go through? Seven, ten, twelve. You just wrote one and you're screaming that it's the best thing you've ever written. Nobody can correct you. There's always room for improvement. And it's because as artists we're very sensitive. It's like, no, my writing is like my baby. I woke up, it took me three months to write this. You, can just, you cannot just come and pick holes and say that it did Okay, so how do we, how do you learn, how do you grow? And some of us, we do this is because we are, we are creatives. But we didn't, maybe that was not the career we started with, maybe. But now we are giving ourselves to it. And we expect everything to click like this. Because it's a talent you have. You need, still need to go through process. There are times I would get feedback notes. I'll be angry, even today sometimes because you're still writing for people. And they would, so, and what they say matters. So when they say, well, I don't understand this, sometimes you argue it out and you reach an understanding. Sometimes they see your point and they say, okay, you're right. And then sometimes they have, they're just talking something. And you're like, ah, how did, do they even understand? That's where your craft comes in. The sad thing is, I told somebody, sometimes we get notes from people who are not writers. How can you, have never written a story, but you want to critique my story? And what did, makes the difference between me and you is the fact that I've gone through process. I am somebody who, with their script, it stands. People that don't know me, I get calls sometimes from people I've never met, and they say, we hear you're a good writer, we've seen your work, we like your work, and that's what has sold me. Even sometimes I go to film festivals and people that, that I've never, they say, oh, we know you. You don't know me, but I know you. I'm like, really? Okay, nice to meet you. It's your work that sells you. Your work that you can sell to a stranger who will not buy your script because he's your friend. Or produce your script because he's your friend. Sorry, is my time gone? I'm so sorry, so sorry. Um, can we finish? Uh, Simon, what's your story? The greatest story ever told is in the Bible. That's just want to say. Starring the biggest hero. Who is that? Jesus. Yes. Last slide, please. Thank you. All right. So please write your stories. Have fun. Well, I, I hope you got something from that time you have a question oh wow questions okay so we'll take your question one two questions thank you kemi um i just you know it, it, it just was a little over five six minutes um that that was i mean i almost felt she was preaching a sermon because the three parts to every story beginning the middle the end and you, you're kind of saying, so what's the unfolding story of my life? And how am I also helping to write that story? Because God just doesn't write a story without us. He writes it with us, together with us. And we are, we're part of that entire mechanism of storytelling. But you know, we all have a story. I just, I just love what I heard. I wish, I think I need to start writing myself. <laughs> You can start with a five-pager. You can do a one-page. And I'm sure Kunle Du has done, I mean, he shared his own story. But, you know, do a one-page and you've got it all out there. Thank you again. Thank you for just guiding us through this. So question. Um, okay, let's, let's watch this video and then we'll take the question. I just wanted us to see this video by Kunle because... I don't know, it just hit me when Kemi was speaking. So we'll watch, we'll watch this video and um, let's, let's see it, guys. Huh? 
they are frying egg. If it's me that I handle this egg now, ordinary four egg, I will just break it into one small container. Bah! Take fork and mix it together. Cha 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 cha. Put frying pan for fire. Shao. Pour oil. Then I will just fry onion. Wicked onion. That if you near it, you will cry like your mother with you. I will chop it into small small. Ka, 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 ka. Pour it into the oil. Bas! Then find shombo. Fresh shombo. That's red like danger. Dice it into small small. Bah, 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 bah. Collabo is with onion inside of fire. Plum. Then add small salt to the egg. Chum. And go and find crayfish. Bah! To spice it. Mix it together. Mix it together. Then I will find a cake bread. Soft one. That they have used butter to spoil the life. Soft bread. Press it together. Form burger. Huh. That's a, that's a story. You wanted to say something about that? What's the conflict? Hunger. Hunger is a conflict. <laughs> it's a conflict. Precisely. You're, ah, you're right as well, in fact. Hunger just just that right I mean, I feel like eating a giggy bread on it now. <laughs> you know. So let's let's take your question and uh... Okay. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and my question, I wanted to ask a question from the aspect, um, there were two things. You were talking about what to write as the aspect of um if you are presented with something like maybe horror, you talked about pornography, then you talked about um, showing, you say you should show not to tell, right? So I wanted to ask a part, okay. Um, you have a movie, um, something you are writing, and then you, wanted, you, you want to showcase a situation where um, there's, a, there's a, a likelihood of an aspect of nudity in the movie. Like, for example, you, have, you want to tell a story from the aspect of, Let's just say, for example, that I, I still need like this in my brain, a sacrifice, a, a, an aspect, a lady with grieving or somebody grieving, and then there has to be that aspect of maybe you don't have to dress to the fullest. Maybe, yeah, so what, how can we? Like... Okay, here's a challenge. In the Bible where they said David saw Bathsheba bathing, what images do you see? The naked woman. Funny enough, I don't. Maybe she's half naked, but not fully naked. The thing is, there's, there are subtle ways. There are very subtle ways. It's not until you show everything. And even sometimes even the suggestion is even stronger than seeing a whole naked body. I probably would even add this. Um, if you watch Anikulapo as well, you find that, um, I'm trying to remember the characters now. You, you haven't. Um, the, I can't remember her name, Saru's wife. The Rolake, there was a part where she was nude. And I saw on Twitter that she really wasn't nude, that it was prosthetics, the, 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 the breast, all of that was fake. So she didn't show her nakedness. It was all part of the makeup. Now, somebody may say, well, that's still, you know, kinds of entices. Again, it's, it's, not, um, so it's, it's not a Christian movie. It's not mainstream Christian. But it, it's interesting to note that whereas somebody would think the actress is given to nudity, she actually didn't show herself. Um, that's a totally different compartment from what is being said. I, you know, I would say this, that generally we must understand that we're containers of values. And anything we're doing, we, we're going out into a space to mold culture and to shape culture based on kingdom values. And those are the things that should drive us. When we were having, um, you know, lunch, Kule was sharing, and he says, look, watch anything he does. He's not going to curse. And once you've drawn the line, Denzel Washington, and we, we, we saw that yesterday, you can't get him to be doing any reckless kind of, you know, thing in his movie. So he's been able to define and draw the lines, and it's because he's a person of faith. 
So it, we, we must also learn to draw the line and know this, that we're not just out there to, it's not about making money, and you spoke about it this morning, where, where basically the world is in a crisis. The world is in trouble. The world and those who hide behind the scenes are pushing an agenda, whether it's gay agenda, whether it's whatever agenda it is. What agenda are we carrying in there? And I think for me, that's the primary thing that must, must drive everything we do out there. I hope that helps you. Okay. Oh, so we have so many questions. Um, push. A question at the back, we'll take that quickly. Uh, okay, my question is, she talked about how when you're writing, you, should, you shouldn't double into other aspects. If you're writing, for example, a tragic story, you should, this, the, the story that you depict from the beginning should have a way of streaming through the end of your story. So how do you, how do you, put measures in place as a writer in order, in order not to go off track. You checkmate, how do you checkmate yourself? Um, from the beginning, it's like, if you're an architect and you're required to build a structure, is it a hospital, is it a hotel, is it a school? They have characteristics that define a school, that define each one. So you can't suddenly put a swimming pool in a classroom, like, like in a hotel. Even people will be like, that's very strange. So from the beginning, the DNA of your story, you have to know what the characteristics of the genre you're writing for. When I say genre, it means a type of story. Is it a romantic type, thriller type, horror type, comedy? Now, it doesn't mean that, because nowadays there are mishmashes of comedy, stroke horror, plus this. But usually those that write it, they are really very good writers because they know you, it's like master the genre. Then you can now play with it anyhow. But if you haven't mastered it and you're just like, oh, I thought it was a horror. Some, oh, I thought sometimes you have producers that you're writing for and then in the middle they'll tell you that, you know that love story we're writing? It should be a horror. <laughs> and they're not asking you to start from the beginning. They're asking you to continue. And you're like, but that's not what we agreed. So that's why I even tell writers from the contract, if we're writing a comedy, you should say comedy. Don't halfway tell me that, oh, no, we should turn it into a horror mystery. So you yourself should know the characteristics of the genre you're writing for. You can mix it if you want, but usually those things start in the beginning. There, are some, there have been some exceptions that somehow have worked. But those are the exceptions. Anybody remember Jennifer? Started as a comedy then. They were cutting heads and chopping people. <laughs> I was like, what happened? <laughs> what happened? That was a like, phew. it was a switch. And maybe because we like the story enough, sure, why not? It worked, but it's not the rule. It's not the usual, that's not the usual uh, path to take. And you're taking a risk when you do that. Because for somebody who doesn't know you, they'll just say, this person doesn't know what they're writing. Because how did we, or you start with romance, boy and girl holding hands, singing love songs, suddenly they're chopping off people's heads. If that's the type of horror you had intended it from the beginning, somehow you would have left clues in the beginning that something's going to happen, something's going to happen. And then when it happens, we're like, yeah, bah. and then when you watch it again, you're like, hey, they were telling us, but we just didn't see it. So I hope that answers your question. All right, I hope it does. Okay, so we've, we've taken those, we'll take the last question. Let me make this announcement before I forget. Tomorrow we're gonna be starting early. Chidera is gonna be joining us tomorrow um, and that's gonna be a powerful session. Now, um, there's gonna be free lunch tomorrow for the first 50 people who enter this auditorium. Fried egg with shombo. <laughs> <laughs> and then, 
I think Gary and Epa for the last, that's, that's on you. So first 50 people, tomorrow you get a ticket, and those four people must be here before 10. Deal? Or no deal? All right. We start at 10, because tomorrow is our last day, and there's a lot of ground to cover. Last question, and then we can take a break. Okay, good afternoon. Um, in story writing, is it okay you have, uh, like, two conflicts? Would that be too much? Hello? Uh, not at all. In fact, sometimes there are two la layers of conflict. Uh, you can have man versus man. For example, a man can be hunted by a beast, yet he's trying to deal with his addiction, which cripples his efforts to try to defeat the beast. So that's man versus himself, van, man versus the beast. And some will even say, if they want to be very intellectual, that you see the beast represents the addiction that guy is, is going through. So while he's fighting with his inner demons, he's also fighting the beast on the outside and the beast on the inside. And people will say, hmm, deep storytelling. Yes. Kunle Shorinyo has a question. <laughs> so I have a question for Mr. Kunle and our dear sister. So I work in a strategic space and a futurist space. So in America, and, 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 I, and I wanted to speak to this very strongly, um, particularly about writing um, your own story and what is going on here writing about what is going on here, and writing the fact of what is going on here. Um, so Rambo, for example, is not real, right? But it's an agenda. When any, if any military, the Nigerian soldier has a complex for facing the US Marine. There's a lot that has been done, Delta Force, over de deliberately putting hype on the US Marine and making him more invisible than he is, larger than life. And other nations have to talk to the army and say, it's not real, though. You know, it's an ordinary, you can kill him. You don't believe that. No. They have to cite themselves to overcome Hollywood before they can fight that soldier. Because Hollywood is not just for fact and truth. It's also for advocacy and propaganda. And there is a way you have to invent your lie deliberately, away from, a lot of things I see in the movie about police officers, I live in America. It's not like that. The police are not, not as always the way it is. On so many levels, there's a lot of systemic issues that are not represented in the movies. American homes don't have fences. It's, it's deliberately, it's an illusion of security, right? And they build all of those things at a level that gives, that fights for national security, that gives a, a reputation about America, right? And so in Nigeria, we have a problem. We're not telling our stories right. So if we, if we speak the truth and fact on our stories a lot of times, we will be telling the truth, but we are also not fighting for our own narrative and not telling our stories right. So is there a balance in writing, in, in managing national image, imagery, in um, pushing out necessary propaganda, in putting out necessary advocacy, mm -hmm. is there a place for not writing what is going on and actually writing what is not going on as what is going on, as the hope of what will go on later, <laughs> and as a deliberate attempt to begin to imprint into our observers the reality of what we need to begin to believe? Are these things possible at all within that space? Uh, let me talk first. Number one, the propaganda being pushed by Hollywood is backed by the US government. That's why when 9-11 happened, I couldn't believe it. You mean Superman did not come flying out to save them? This is a Superman type of situation. Or that the CIA, FBI, that in films, they're always invisible, men in black, the way they step out, they have all these secrets. You mean they could not stop this? And then also look at our government. I know more about American history when I left university than Nigerian history. I knew barely nothing about Biafra, except I, when I met somebody who was from the East. Because the government felt if we teach it 
then we are causing division. But they don't know that the thing is, if you do not teach what happened in the past, you are doomed to repeat it because you do not realize what war means. It's an abstract concept. But those who went through it, who tell the stories of how they suffered and starved and people died, they know what it is. So our government does not push the telling of Nigerian history, especially from a point of maybe the heroism. I mean, even now, the pe person who wrote the national anthem, how many people remember who he is? There was a picture of a man in uh, Olympus drawing book. For years, I wondered, what is this man lying? It, that picture looked very abstract to me, but until they said he was the first Nigerian Olympian. And he died because he did not support the Biafran War. I didn't know who he was. Our heroes, we don't sing about them. But I know about Martin Luther, the king, the king. I know about American heroes. I knew about the Civil War. I know about slavery because they tell the stories. And they tell it and tell it and tell it and tell it and tell it. We, our government feels that it will cause division. So not, let's not say it. There was a film that came out, The Milkmaid. It had to do with, uh, I think, northern terrorism. And they refused it to be played in Nigerian cinemas. It could only be played in festivals because they felt it was too touchy. If I, yeah, if I write a script based on what's happening in the north, there's a way I have to write it. Okay, for instance, I was called on a project that had to do with uh, no, it's three young men hijacked a plane in protest of a Biola election being nullified. This really happened. This is a fantastic story, youth. And they were not doing it for money. They believed in a cause. And they felt we are hijacking this plane because we're protesting what the government did, blah, 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 blah. But then what happened? Silence. I remember this happened in the 90s. So this was a long time ago before social media. Isn't that an interesting story? It should have been made into a film years ago. Those boys were locked up in prison and silently left out after 15 years. And nobody knows their story. Thankfully, somebody's picking up their story. But even then, they're trying to be careful. Like, we don't want to upset the government. You know, the political people of that time, they are still alive. They'll say, what agenda are we pushing? This is your own government. America has that thing of freedom. You know, Americans, they love their freedom. We're Americans. We'll say what we will. Blah, 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 blah. This is America. I'll say. Mm -hmm. Here, there's the censorship board who will tell you, you cannot say that. You cannot do that. I'm not talking about the, I'm talking about the negative things. Like, if I have a vision for the Nigerian police, I of want, course. I want, so if I now show a policeman greeting in a different way, yes. I am imprinting in the masses a different thing. Yes. So I'm not just trying not to tell our story. I'm not only telling what our story should be. That is what we call aspirational. Perfect. And that's beautiful. Okay. That is beautiful. Sorry to go on the negative. No, it's but okay. I just wanted you guys to, to get that. Yeah. That is also visioning at that level. The thing you is, know. you just have to balance it. Yeah. So that we don't feel which Nigeria is this. <laughs> The, 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 the argument I probably would have, and it's not, it's not an argument, is that so when, when you look at Navy SEALs in America, yes. you can't deny that they go through rigorous training. Oh, yeah. So they're pushing the envelope, but within certain boundaries. Correct. And I think that inspiration does work. Yes. If you push the Nigerian police story out of the reality on ground, <laughs> you, you see, so there's a context. If we did a story, this is my take, if we did a story on military training and we actually go through the rigors and then we push it times three to say that, look, the Nigerian soldier, look, put him in the midst of whatever crisis. He, one man can kill 300. The training that everybody can see and relate with supports That's any aspirational thought. But if there is no foundation of training, and we're pushing that you can kill 300 men. 
I think there will be such a huge gap. And then when the foreigner comes, you see, I've been to the U.S. You live there. But I've been to the U.S. and I've not seen what you see in terms of their police. And except, you know, what we see, you know, mainstream media and so, some of these instances. I still feel America is a safe place. That's me from the outside. And they've sold me that story. So if we say, for example, the North is safe. And an investor comes and is kidnapped in the same North. That your story is wrecked. So I, I feel that we should do it. But we should know how we do it and not push it outside the envelope of reality. And it just is a bubble out there that will burst easily. I don't know. Yes, that's please, that's what yes. I was saying. Please, he wants to add yeah. something. Um, thank you for that, that suggestion. It's a, it's a very noble one. When, personally, when I talk about uh, writing, maybe workshops or festivals or master classes, there are three things I always say that your story must go high on. One, simplicity. Make it simple, not too complicated. Everybody wants easy, you know, nobody wants to go into mental gymnastics. Make it simple, straightforward. Two, believability. It has to score pretty well, too. And the third thing is relatability. So your story has to be simple, believable, and relatable. You can make it simple, straightforward. Nigerian Rambo, big muscle, tall guy. We have some of them in the army. I've seen, I've seen a couple of them. Dresses well, buff, good marksman. He's probably going to be on the presidential guard. I mean, on the bodyguard of the president. You won't find him on the streets. So if you want to write that, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I've seen the White House the Oval Office in movies. I don't know what the office of my president looks like. So there are certain secrecies that may make that difficult. You can make it. The question is, can we make it? Oh, yes, we can. Now, will it be acceptable? That's a totally different conference. Yeah. So when you see... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who is on the angle today at all? Because it's a sweet story. Yeah. The, re the relatability is energy, yeah. not fact. Yes. So you are talking about relatability with fact. Mm. There's, there's resonance with energy. Where mm -hmm. What we are you talking about is not real. Like horror movies, mm. you don't know what they are putting there is not real. Mm. But it relates with your sense of fear. Mm. It can relate with your sense of um, thoroughness, mm. your sense of anxiety. Yes. There, there's no fact in that, mm. but there's energy in that. Yes. Okay, so you then have... Um, Maybe Inspector Julius that I know, real yes, life story. Yes. Ordinary human being. I had a case in 2017, which was the worst financial case I ever had, right? I was exposed to hundreds and hundreds of millions, right? This man, and I'm not exaggerating, if I have found a physical man of integrity in my life, of all the human beings I know, and I know a lot of people, he will be number one. He's a police officer. He did, I mean, incredible things. I've, I don't even believe that Nigerian police can do. If I am you, I'm not a writer, I will do a true life story on Inspector Julius. I will underscore the corruption in Nigerian police, but I will also underscore that people like him exist. And I will show him on his job. So I'm not going to come and lie that this does not exist. In all those movies too, right, they write those stories that are, that are still contextual. Do you understand? But they bring two things. Either a true life event of what is not scaling, that they need to scale, or something that is not scaling at all, but there's a possibility. They don't deny what is going on, but they show us all of that possible. Like Space 1999. Now we have gone to the moon. Now we are going to Mars. At that time, it wasn't, it was just ideas, right? So what I'm saying is that, and, and at times it's not government, man. At times maybe liberals. Liberals have their agenda. It's not nothing to do with government. Conservatives have their agenda. Individual billionaires have agenda. They make a story on a particular research or a product they want to introduce in five years' time that they're really researching now. So all kinds of things happen. I'm just saying that people have a call, maybe as an advocacy, as an advocate, or, you know, and then he wants to begin to speak to something, right, that does not need anybody's approval. He just wants to, so maybe what I would say is energy, the sweetness of it or the fear in it, or the transformation in it, maybe future Oshodi. If I want to show that Oshodi can look like this, do you understand? It will, it will be communicated in a way that people know what Oshodi is, but I'm talking about future Oshodi, right? 
So that's what I'm trying to say. And that, so stories at times can, can be in that realm. Now, in my job as a strategic, as a, um, strategic, as a futurist, people who want to write some stories, I don't know if that call us to meetings, we actually say, okay, what is life in 2050? How is real estate in 2050? How can we bring it into what we are doing now? It's not real yet. They can say, how is um, um, hospitality in the next 50 years? And we look at it with our own minds and say, this is it, right? There is a cartoon that said that there was COVID in 2020. I've forgotten about the cartoon. Say, this is 2020. It, it, so, 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 so this just happened, right? This was in the 90s that this cartoon came out, right? The Simpsons, for example, showed a black president. The Simpsons showed that Donald Trump was president. So people infuse different things, even of your reality, that even when Donald Trump came physically to become president, nobody still believed him. How much more when he was in the cartoon? <laughs> Do you understand? So that's what I'm trying to say. Can people, and as experts, I'm saying, can people own that kind of reality? That, that's their own unique expression. Yes. Um, the answer to any how you look at it is yes. Like you say, like you said, yes, I, I, and I do believe this, some of the stories uh, exist. But what I'm just saying is, with the example of the Oval Office in America, is that these stories now have to be made available, like your experience with that officer. There's also a story about a Nigerian uh, ship that sank, and one man survived after how many weeks? Was it three weeks or four weeks or something? Yeah, the guy was in the belly of the sea. It was Nigerian Marines with other guys, foreign guys, that went to dig him out. He was the last survivor. That one, I'm waiting for the day it will drop from Hollywood. All of us will do, we wear African attire and go to red carpet. <laughs> like we did with Wakanda. As if we don't know African stories before. As if we don't know the story of uh, Bashan Ogumola in the bad. As if you don't know the Jebo um, the, you know, the, all the, we have the stories, but you know, people, we're not so. Individual stories like that, once they're made available, uh, Nigerian soldiers, there are a few of them that can do that and it definitely can be marketed. But then, propaganda and all those things, nobody needs to fund it. And if the intention is box office, then you have to put all the elements of, you know, maybe not necessarily the Rambo example that you started with, of course, but that can be. The only thing is that by the time Nigerians see a big muscled Nigerian Rambo killing terrorists, you begin to wonder, uh, no. So that can be done. It's just that how we tell it is going to matter. Uh, just to wrap what he said, you can write anything because you're literally creating. If, if it's uh, Nigerian in the year 2070 and we're all living in space or something, write it. It's just that the person who produces has to make it real. It has to become real. Well, thank you. It's, it's good to have this dialogue at the front row and for you to also be witnesses to it. Because this is, this is what, deep conversations like this is what pushes us ahead. And what appears sometimes like conflict and dispute um, is, is really how we get better at this, you know, assignment that we do. Well, um, we've come to the end of today. It's been a loaded day. Tomorrow is going to be the last day. And um, tomorrow is a, tomorrow is Salah. Yes, it is. I'm sure you know. Monday is a public holiday. I'm sure you know. Um, tomorrow is the prophet's birthday, Eid al Monday is a public holiday, so you've got a long weekend. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you um, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Remember, you want free lunch? Just be here at 10. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll set the ball rolling straight away with Chidera. And then we'll have Kunle Dogu, Kemi, and we'll have, you know, a couple of other platforms where we truly can dialogue and ask all the questions we can. God bless you guys. Uh, thank you. And thanks to our media guys that are powering everything. Uh, let's appreciate them. Now, okay, so pictures for front row personnel. We'll do that quickly. <laughs>